All right, today we're going to look at a passage from Romans chapter 10. I'm continuing in a series I started last week on the ongoing significance of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, reformed and always reforming was one of the mottos that came out of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, October 31st, as I said, was the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation that uh, historians <coughs> mark the beginning of it with uh, Martin Luther's nailing uh, 95 challenges, 95 articles of debate, if you will, on the door of a church in Wittenberg, Germany, uh, to call the church to reformation, to call the church to correction. And uh, unfortunately, uh, his uh, concerns went unheeded and he was excommunicated from the church. He never intended to start anything new in terms of a denomination or anything like that. That wasn't his intention, but that ended up being the result, as is often the case throughout history. Uh, but uh, there's still plenty of ongoing significance. Today I want to talk about two aspects of the teachings that are summed up in what's called the five solas of the Protestant Reformation. S-O-L-A-S. -S. Sola means, it's Latin, and it just means alone, or like we get the word soul, S-O-L-E, uh, alone. And there were five things that came out of the Reformation in terms of the important teachings. And uh, one was justification by faith alone. We looked at that last week. That believers are justified by faith alone. And that is to emphasize that it's faith by which we receive salvation and it's not works by which we achieve salvation. Faith receives the grace and the gift of God of salvation that was made available for us in Jesus Christ. That, that is also connected to the next teaching uh, that I want to highlight today somewhat, and it's grace alone. Grace alone. We are saved uh, through faith alone, but it's by grace alone as well, meaning it's not anything that we do or anything that anyone else can do for us that can in any, in any way merit for us salvation. One of the major problems in Martin Luther's day was this teaching that people could pay the church what's called indulgences and it would in some way shorten their stay in purgatory which is not the same as hell. Purgatory was a place of purification, as the name seems to indicate in and of itself. But it could get their relatives or themselves a shorter stay in purgatory if they gave money called indulgences to the church that would often go for uh, elaborate building projects and cathedrals. A lot of the grand cathedrals that mark the landscape of Europe were built on the backs of the givers of indulgences, so to speak. That's one of the main things that really set Martin Luther off. And the idea that in some way these practices could merit for someone justification in any sense. It was justification by faith alone, but we're saved and justified, sanctified, and everything else by the grace of God alone, which means that's what God has done for us in and through Jesus Christ, period. It's a gift that's offered to us without price. Without price. There's nothing that we can do to earn it. Grace can never be achieved, but it must be received. It must be received. We receive it by faith. Grace is the gift of God. Grace is the salvation of God that's available because of what Jesus did. Nothing that we can do, nothing that we have done or could ever do, or nothing that anyone else could do for us. There's another one, we'll look at this next week. Another teaching that came out of the Protestant Refor Reformation is we're saved by Christ alone, what Christ did for us alone. So there's overlap with all of these things. But today I want to focus on grace alone as we just talked about. But the underlying teaching of all of these different uh, doctrines that came out of the Protestant Reformation 
And the last will be the glory of God alone. We're saved for the glory of God alone. That's why we're saved. The purpose for which we are saved. We'll talk about what that means. But the underlying teaching behind all of these doctrines, all of these other solas, is the doctrine of script, Scripture. <coughs> scripture alone. And that was to emphasize that it's the Scriptures that alone determine what is true and right and accurate and authentic Christian faith and practice. It's the Scriptures that define for us what the grace of God actually is. It's Scripture that defines for us what faith really is. It's Scripture that defines for us who Christ really is. It's Scripture that defines for us what the glory of God really is. You understand what I'm saying? So it's Scripture alone is what we're going to really focus in on today. Here in Romans chapter 10, I'll pick up in verse 11 here, Paul writes, For the Scripture says, Everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek or Gentile, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. A promise from God. Hallelujah. How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing. And hearing through the word of Christ. Hearing through the word of Christ. This is the word of God for us, the people of God today. Thanks be to God. Right off the bat, you hear that faith comes through hearing, and the hearing has to come from the hearing of the Word about Jesus Christ, or the Word about Jesus Christ. It's a proclamation of the Gospel. It's an oral proclamation of the Gospel. What is the good news of Jesus Christ? But as we can already see here from what Paul is saying, that it is a Word that is authenticated by the written Word of God. It's an oral Word that must be in harmony with the written Word of God. Paul himself, as he talks about this oral plot proclamation, he can't help himself but to quote written Scripture, as you see here. And he had continued, as he continues on, he alludes to Psalm 19 in the following verses there after 17. And in Psalm 19, hear what Psalm 19 says to us today. It ends with a pretty common prayer among preachers as preachers begin to pray. Uh, and as they end their prayer before they begin to preach the Word, they oftentimes, and I've used this many times, will say, and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, my heart, be acceptable in your sight O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's Psalm 19, 14. You may have heard that before. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. How do we know that my words and our hearts are acceptable, what we believe in our hearts, how do we know that they're acceptable to God? Well, we can know because God has revealed His will, what He desires, who He is, who we are because of Him, who we are in Him, and who He created us to be. He has revealed that to us in the very, this psalm tells us, Psalm 19 tells us, He's done so in the very fabric of creation itself. 
that creation itself, the glory of creation itself, testifies to the glory of God. That's at the beginning of Psalm 19. That's what Paul quotes. But listen to this. It also goes on to tell us about the written Word of God. Listen to what here Psalmist, the Psalm, uh, Psalmist of Psalm 19 says. He says, verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. We talked about the fear of the Lord in the last few weeks. Enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous for the most part. Wait a minute. I got that. Wait a minute. I, I, wait a minute. No, I didn't say that. Did righteous all together. The proclamation, the oral proclamation, the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God must be in harmony with the written Word of God. Sola Scriptura means that the Bible, the Bible, Old and New Testament, is the ultimate standard and the ultimate criterion for what is truly Christian faith and authentic Christian faith and practice. We see how this plays out in the book of Acts as they're going out and they're proclaiming the good news about who Jesus is, about what God has done for Israel and what God has done for humanity in and through Jesus Christ. Peter and Paul, they're proclaiming this good news that God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead and through Him and through Him alone. For there, it says in the Acts, Peter says, there's no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. They're preaching about Jesus. And we see there in Acts 17 that as Paul and Silas begin to preach this good news, that in this place called Berea, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, it says these Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians in that they received the word with eagerness of mind and because they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. They were comparing the oral proclaimed word with the written word of the scriptures and they were looking for a match and that's exactly what they should have been doing. This has been the practice of the church, of the people of God from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Paul, when he is arrested later on in the book of Acts and he is still preaching, he is still teaching, he is still talking about Jesus even though he knows that he can lose his head, which he eventually would, over it, he's still preaching and he's still teaching about Jesus. Hallelujah. Now that's somebody that's got faith. That's somebody that knows that they know. Acts 26, he's talking to King Agrippa, who has power, a lot of power over him. And Paul boldly proclaims to him the good news about Jesus and talks to him about his need for repentance and he says and he assures him that he's doing nothing but proclaiming what Moses and the prophets had promised all along. You see again that connection between the oral proclamation and the written word of God. In the time of the Protestant Reformation, what had happened is the same thing that's happened throughout the history of the people of God is that human traditions and human opinions creep in and eventually are exalted above the written and the revealed Word of God in the pages of Holy Scripture. In the day and time of the Reformers, it was traditions that developed about purgatory that have no biblical substantiation works whatsoever. There were traditions about Mary that have no biblical substantiation whatsoever. There were traditions about what it requires to be justified. 
that cannot be authenticated through the pages of the written word. There were traditions about this one particular leader in Rome that they called the Pope that cannot be substantiated by the written word of God or by the early history of the church as far as that goes. So they were standing against these traditions of men that had been exalted above the written word of God and they were reclaiming the promises of the word of God in their day and time. And it wasn't anything new. If you got a Bible, look real quickly at Mark chapter 7. This is what happened in Jesus' day. People make a huge mistake here with Jesus often, so often today. So ironically so. Here in this confrontation that Jesus uh, is having with the religious leaders of his day and time, the Pharisees and the scribes, he says in our chapter five, uh, 7, verse 5, the Pharisees say to him, they ask him, why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, this is what Jesus said, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You see that right there? And he goes on to say, and you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. You abandon the Word of God to hold to human traditions. And he said to them, you have a... And this is sarcasm. He's saying this sarcastically. You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition." The mistake that's often made is that, that the, the bone that Jesus had with the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders is that, that they were taking the law too seriously. Now we read what Psalm 19 said about the law, and people have in their heads a lot of times nowadays that Jesus didn't agree with that. And that that was the problem the Pharisees had, is that, that they had too much respect for the law. The Word of God, that's perfect, remember? Remember, righteous altogether, not for the most part. That's not what Jesus had a problem with. Jesus had a problem with them taking their own opinions and their own traditions and their own little ideas that had developed that are contrary to the Scriptures and they had exalted them above the Scriptures. That's what Jesus had a problem with. He didn't have a problem with them because they were taking the law so seriously he had a problem with them because they were not taking it seriously enough. They were coming up with little clever ways of, you go on and read the context, Can you, that math, Mark 7, you read the context, they were finding loopholes around the commandments of God. That's what he had a problem with. And in his ministry, in these types of confrontations with the religious leaders, who were hard-hearted and led astray, he would often say, have you not read in the Scriptures? In this confrontation with the devil himself who is tempting him to use his power and authority in ungodly ways, what does Jesus say in response to each and every temptation of Satan himself? Who quotes Scripture to him? Mind you, out of context, because the devil will use Scripture for his own purposes. How does Jesus respond to each and every temptation? <coughs> he responds with a recurring refrain. It is written. He takes it back to the written Word of God. The view that Jesus had of Scripture when he was in a, a confrontation over what is really marriage. Mark chapter 10, Mark 19 and what marriage was really supposed to be. He says, God, he quotes Genesis and says there, God said, even though it's not a passage where it says God is speaking personally. To Jesus, that passage in Genesis chapter 2 about God's design for marriage 
was as good as God speaking himself. That's why John Wesley would say <coughs> things like, the Word of God, the written Word of God is as true as God Himself is true. <coughs> the Word of God is the standard for God's people. And we always have to be wary of traditions that can creep in and exalt themselves or be exalted above the Word of God. But it's not that all traditions are bad. And it's not that all other ideas are bad. Uh, Matt, flip to the next uh, slide here. Scripture itself is the source for our faith. Our faith is in a person, not in a book, but Scripture directs us to this person. And it does so in an accurate way. It tells us about who this person really is and what this person named Jesus is really like. And Jesus, in turn, says that He reveals to us the Father. So we can know God the Father through Jesus the Son, but we know about Jesus the Son most clearly and most explicitly through the written Word of God. And I've taught this, I love this story, but on that walk to Emmaus, after the, this is, you got to understand, this is the first day of the resurrection. Jesus has been raised from the dead, and what does He do for His disciples when He catches them on these, these two on the road to Emmaus? He comes alongside them. They don't realize who He is. And He begins to talk with them and He chastises them for being slow to believe all that the prophets had foretold. And then He begins to do a Bible study. He takes them through the law, the Psalms, and the prophets so that they can know Him. So that they can recognize Him. That's how important this really is. So Scripture is right there in terms of our the source of our faith and the content of our faith and our trust in who Jesus Christ is. And from there, we will develop traditions. It's going to be inevitable. There are going to be certain traditions, ways of doing things, ways of thinking about things, ways of approaching things. There, there's going to be certain traditions that are going to develop. And as long as they are in harmony with the Scriptures, we're in good shape. We're doing well. But if they become contradictory to the Scriptures and we realize that, then what must go? The tradition or the Scriptures? Scripture. Now, that may sound like an easy decision, but people are having a hard, hard time with that today and always have really. Tradition or Scripture? Reason or logic? Our philosophies, our ideas that we systematize, the theologies that we develop, all of that will fall under reason, using the minds that God gives us. And we're supposed to. Jesus says you love God with your whole heart, soul, strength, and mind. mind. We have to use our knowledge. We have to think. We'll have ideas. And as long as they are in harmony... With the revealed written Word of God, we're in good shape. But when we find that they are contradictory to the written Word of God, we've got to make a decision. What are we going to keep? What's going to go? The Pharisees, Jesus said, were throwing out the Scriptures. They were throwing out the commandments. They wouldn't say that. But that's what they were doing without saying it. That's what was happening with the Roman Catholic Church during the Protestant Reformation. They wouldn't say that that's what they are doing. They're exalting human reason. Every argument that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, 2 Corinthians 10 says, we've got to cast down and lead every thought captive to the obedience of Christ as He is revealed in the pages of Holy Scripture. And we can have experiences. When John Wesley would talk about experiences of the Christian faith, he was talking about those things that confirm the witness of Scripture. What Scripture says about sin. It's the law of God that reveals our sin and thereby reveals our need for salvation and our need for a Savior. And the law, Paul says in Galatians, leads us to Christ. And we can have an experience of that, a confirmation 
that authenticates the teachings of Scripture. When the, the Spirit convicts our hearts of sin and we agree with the Word of God, yes, this is wrong. Yes, the way I'm living is wrong. I'm headed in the wrong direction. And yes, I, I've got a problem. Now what, God? What must I do to be saved? That's what the law will do for us. And it will lead us to Christ and we can cry out to Him for mercy. And as Paul said, all those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But what if you don't agree with the diagnosis of the problem? Are you going to agree with that same word promise of the solution? Not really. We've got to trust the Word. Our experience can never be exalted above the written Word of God. Every Word of God is true, the Bible says. Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 12, Proverbs 30, all say we shall not add to nor subtract from God's Word because what will happen if we do? Then it will not be God's Word anymore. And it will lead us astray. And it will bring a curse. As a matter of fact, the last book in the Bible ends with that same warning. Have y'all ever noticed that? <clears throat> you probably didn't realize that it was based on Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 12, Proverbs 30. It all say this thing, same thing, that you shall not add to or subtract from God's Word, God's revelation. <clears throat> and at that last book, that last passage, there's a warning not to add or subtract, because those who do their share in the tree of life will be taken away. That's how serious it is. We don't tamper with the Word of God. These challenges always <coughs> present themselves in this fallen world. They're always recurring. We're always tempted to go along with the traditions of men rather than the revealed Word of God and the written Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, that all Scripture, it says in verse 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God may be equipped, thoroughly equipped, and prepared for every good work. We often don't realize the context of that. In the context, Paul is warning Timothy. He's saying in the last days there's going to be times of great apostasy and people are going to toss out the Word of God and the will of God for their own desires and they won't put up with sound doctrine anymore and they won't have anything to do with anything that's true and righteous altogether and they're going to heap to themselves teachers to suit their own desires to tell them what they want to hear. This is all the context of 2 Timothy 3. And he's saying, but as for you... As for you, Timothy, you stick to what you have learned and heard, and he learned it from his mother first and from his grandmother, <coughs> Eunice and Lois, two of the women that are named in, in the first epistle of, uh, of Paul to Timothy. They had taught him, but what, they had, what did they teach him? He goes on to say, they had taught him the sacred scriptures which is able to make one wise for salvation. Therefore, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable. For doctrine, reproof, and correction, and training in righteousness. The written Word of God is the standard. The written Word of God is the measure of what is true and right and authentic in terms of Christian faith and practice. The Word of God is the corrector. <coughs> and in terms of Christian faith and practice in, in the straightforward commandments of God, it can never be corrected or else it's not true and righteous altogether. It's only true and righteous for the most part. Just imagine yourself, if you're trying to lead a project, Josh, and you want to get a crew together to help you build a small little house, maybe a little shack, maybe just a shed to put a tractor in. And you try to get 10 people together to do it without any objective standard for measure. And they're just doing it based on their best guess and their whims. And they're whatever they feel like that day. Is that a shed you want to put your tractor in? Is that a house you want to live in? There has to be a standard. There has to be a measure. And with this simple thing, my dad could have handed me this right here 
when I was five years old and said, here, go measure this board for me to cut. That might have been a mistake. I'm pretty doggone sure it would have been. It'd be like the same time he gave me the hoe and said, here, go hoe the weeds out of these little cantaloupe plants. You know, when I was about seven or eight. That didn't go too well either. So not only do I need the standard, I need to be taught some things. There's some things I've got to understand before I can read this accurately. I need to understand numbers. You know, just one, two, three, four. We, we take that for granted when we're adults, but I've got a little kid. You've got a little kid, Stacy. That's not to be taken for granted. You find out when you've got little kids. You've got to be taught numbers. Then you got to be taught fractions. Oh my goodness. Holy cow. Well, what's the difference between five and a half and five and three quarters? Is that a big deal? Does it really matter? Four little marks. <laughs> I know we were doing that mission project in Plymouth, North Carolina, and we had the, one of the projects was a deck. We were laying just the boards on a deck. The frame had already been set up, and we were just laying the boards. And the first couple of boards, I think the first few boards had been started, uh, and when we got there, uh, we got one of these things out, and we started because we were coming in behind another crew that had gotten it started, and uh, they left instructions on how long to cut the boards. If we had not used one of these, and we had just gone with what they had said, and we had cut every board to the length that they said cut it, we would have been all, we would, that deck would have been about a foot away from the house, the, the mobile home, by, by the time we got to the end. So we did some measurements. We realized we had to make some adjustments in order for us to have each board against the house flush by the time we got to the end. Just a little bit. It's just a little difference. But by the time you got to the end, it made all the difference in the world. We always have to get back to the standard. We're always having to teach people how to read and how to understand the standard. It's not that simple. It's not that cut and dry. We have to get back to the Word of God. We still have challenges today. I would submit to you that the challenges that the church faces in the Western world and America and Europe today is just as every bit as challenging as what Martin Luther faced in his day and time and what the other reformers faced in their day and time. Look at your hymnals to uh, chapter, uh, not chapter, page 110, the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It was written by Martin Luther. I would ask you to go back later today and Google this or something when you get home and just look up the words and it kind of gives you the, the uh, things that he was going through and the challenges that he was facing because of the stand that he was taking on the Word of God in his day and time. But look at what he says at the beginning of verse 4 there. Look at what he says there. He says, a, That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abide the earthly powers. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about the leaders of the church in his day and time, especially the Pope and others who had exalted their own opinions above the Word of God. And he says the Word is above all of them. The Word is the ultimate standard that we all have to get back to. That we have to get back to. He talks in this hymn, you can sense the challenges that he faced, the fear that he faced, the, the threats that he faced in his life because of his stand on the Word of God. We still have these challenges today. One of the most prominent teachers in the United Methodist Church today, one of the most prominent pastors, has the largest church in the entire denomination. Uh, a year and a half or so ago, a couple years ago, he wrote a book called Making Sense of the Bible. And he said a lot of really disturbing things in this book. His name's Adam Hamilton. Uh, he pumps out books like they're hot cakes. Uh, he does, basically what he does is he puts sermon series together He's got a large church, a large, large production staff, and he turns all of his sermon series into books. Okay, and one of those books is called Making Sense of the Bible. And, and in that, he said a couple of things. One is that the Bible is inspired, but it's really no more inspired than the writings of any other Christian throughout history. 
He said, really, the Bible's inspired, but it's no more inspired than saying he specifically named the, named the, the writings of, say, C.S. Lewis, who wrote in the 1940s and 50s and beyond. And no more inspired than, say, I write stuff every other week or so. I'm writing a blog. I write a lot of stuff. I'm a Christian. <laughs> My stuff is just as inspired as the Bible. There's other people. Rachel Andrews, she likes to write blog articles do things like that. Her writings are just as inspired as the Bible. Well, if that is the case, then I know that at times I need to be correct. That I need my ideas and my beliefs need to be adjusted. To be in harmony and to come in line with the Scripture because the Scripture is the corrector, in my opinion. But if the Pages of Scripture can be just as inspired, but no more so than me, then that means that Scripture may at times stand in need of, guess what? Correction. And guess who can tell us what needs to be corrected? Adam Hamilton. And he has told us that there are certain passages of Scripture, some which involve straightforward commands of Scripture, that he says that we can dismiss and reject as never having been inspired by God in the first place. Yeah. Now I see why Jesus said to the Pharisees and the scribes, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God <coughs> for your traditions. You see that? We've got to stand on the Word. The flower withers. The grass fades. The opinions of men and the gimmicks of men <coughs> come and go. But the word of the living God stands forever. And the question is, will we continue <coughs> to stand on the word? Will we stand on the pages of the Bible? Will we stand on the Bible as our only rule for faith in practice for our ultimate standard for what is true and godly and right in terms of Christian faith and practice. The Bible is more than just a rule book. It's more than just a measure. The Bible is a letter from God to you and me. My son, Silas, has a pen pal in Brazil named Ryan. I won't say the last name. Ryan wrote him a letter recently. Silas and Ryan have never seen each other face to face and they've never had a picture that I know of of each other. But they write to each other. And their moms tell them and help them write their letters and what they want to say. And they'll tell each other about what they like, what they don't like, what they like to do, what they like to eat, what they like to watch on television. And through these letters, they're getting to know each other. <coughs> They're getting to be in a relationship with each other, even though they've never seen each other face to face. That's what the Bible is in terms of our relationship with a living God. We can get to know Him before we ever meet Him. And we will meet Him, but before we meet Him, we will already know Him through the pages of the written Word of God and through the power and the presence of the Spirit of God. Thanks be to God.